the previous video, I talked about using IRC uh, in the context of botnet communications. And, and really, I mentioned that IRC was one of the most popular ways by which bots communicated with their command and control server. Uh, and nowadays, however, the lion's share of botnet communications happens over the hypertext transfer protocol, or HTTP. In other words, um, most bots communicate with their CNC servers using HTTP. And in fact, uh, some very popular examples of HTTP bots include uh, the Zeus bot, um, Black Energy is another one. So Black Energy, uh, Corgo, uh, Bees Up, uh, there's this is ClickBot A, and there's a, just a bunch of others. ClickBot A is not quite as, as popular as uh, Zeus, for example. It's, it's not one of the more popular ones, but it's an interesting application of using a botnet for doing click fraud. Now, the, the notion of an HTTP bot has been around for a while, but they really kind of surged in popularity. They had this big rise in popularity uh, via things called exploit kits. And in fact, um, there were some exploit kits, and, and some of their names include uh, um, MPAC, Ice Pack. Uh, was the third one, I believe, was called Fiesta. And these exploit kits basically contained uh, web browser exploits, and they made it easy for anybody, any cyber criminal, to uh, to mount a web browser exploit and compromise the system as a result. And w these exploit kits were often then used to install a botnet onto or a piece of bot software onto a node. And and in this case. They use things like Zeus uh, and, and other uh, common HTTP bots uh, to, to infect the host that, that where the host was infected using something like MPAC or IcePack. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, HTTP is actually the uh, effectively the de facto protocol for the web. It's it's really the you know when your web browser uh, communicates with uh, communicates with the internet at large and maybe goes to a particular web server and, and downloads a web page, that traffic is actually happening over HTTP. So it's really the de facto protocol for the web. And, and as a result, HTTP is available practically on any network. It's, it's rarely, if ever, filtered. Uh, and, and as a result of that, there's kind of been a, a self propagating uh, phenomenon where more and more applications use HTTP for communications, especially because it's firewall friendly. And in fact, you know, what typically happens is, is uh, if you're in an enterprise network, you might actually have, let's say, a bunch of systems on the enterprise network. Uh, systems are trying to communicate to the internet at large, but before they can actually get to the internet at large, they are, are have to go through a corporate firewall, which is going to filter their traffic to determine if that traffic is uh, legitimate or not. And you know, if you're using, if you're communicating over some obscure protocol that nobody's ever heard of, there's a better chance that protocol will get trapped by the firewall because the enterprise does not want you to be communicating in, in kind of bizarre ways to the external world. But if you're using something like HTTP, there's a good chance that uh, in the absence of any other filtering, that protocol will just be allowed to sail through. And if, if firewalls started blocking HTTP, that would just pose a lot of problems for an enterprise in, in practice. Uh, and in fact, because uh, HTTP is so firewall friendly, I've even heard many uh, security experts joke and, and they refer to HTTP as the, uh, the automatic firewall traversal protocol. And so um, you know, as a result, you, you could imagine that uh, a lot of botnets and other types of malicious pieces of software will use HTTP. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that pretty much every user is generating a ton of legitimate HTTP traffic when they surf the web. And if they go to Facebook or if they go to Google, etc., um, they're communicating over HTTP to these sites. Now, you know, if you want to contrast that to IRC, uh, if, if you have a, a, a node and it's it's generating IRC traffic. You know that would be immediately a red flag. You know, and in most enterprises, you would say, "Well, most users have no reason to be communicating over IRC, and so you might block that communication if you're a firewall." On the other hand, if you have communication that's that's happening over HTTP, you know, no firewall is going to want to block it because uh, on that basis alone, no firewall is going to want to block it because that could cause a lot of problems. Okay, and it's it's just not a red flag like like IRC is. So as you can begin to imagine, bot masters have really especially liked this aspect of HTTP, and, and they use it as a command and control protocol. Now, given this, just the sheer volume of HTTP traffic that's emanating from most endpoints, 
uh, especially those in, in an enterprise setting, uh, you're trying to find malicious traffic is pretty much akin to finding a needle in a haystack. I mean, it sounds kind of proverbial, but it's, it's true. Uh, most HTTP traffic is legitimate. So trying to find bad traffic that's, that's using HTTP is, is going to be very hard to do uh, without doing any kind of deeper inspection. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is, is and this is kind of going into some of the mechanics of how HTTP bots work, uh, they basically periodically make requests to their CNC server. So for example, you know, if you're an HTTP infected bot, let's say this is you and, and you're infected, let me just use, how about the color red to show infection, then what's going to happen is, is the bot is going to communicate to a CNC server somewhere and it's going to communicate over HTTP. Uh, it's going to effectively fetch a web page and, uh, you know, or, or maybe provide a, a status message of some sort via URL and then get back a list of commands from the server. The, the CNC server in this case is actually just a web server. Okay. Now the other thing I do want to mention is that in addition to staying under the radar at the network level, HTTP bots are also better able to stay under the radar on the endpoint itself. And, and, and let me kind of elaborate on that. Most malware, or I would say because at least some malware, um, tries to hide itself uh, inside of another process. So it's typically they use techniques like process injection and, and so on and so forth. Now, to help improve security, some operating systems might employ uh, what we call process hardening technologies. I'm just going to write that down because it's, it's a common term in the industry, process hardening. And, and these process hardening technologies are designed uh, to do things like, like, for example, service hardening, which might try to limit the ports over which a particular service can communicate. Okay, so they may, the, the idea is can we, can we limit what a particular process or really what a particular service might do? And if we can limit that, we, we may be able to actually inhibit malware from running. And one way it can be inhibited is by only limiting how communication occurs. Now, since it's easier to find core operating system services and components that use HTTP, uh, in turn, bots can more easily piggyback on these types of services in order to maintain some degree of stealthiness. So rather than actually uh, going out and maybe uh, communicating directly over, let, let's see if you've got a bot on the system, um, in, instead of generating HTTP track fit directly itself, what it might do is it might find a legitimate process. Let's say it finds, you know, iExplore.exe, which is the, uh, the name for Internet Explorer. And it might then inject its traffic or maybe inject itself into the process space of iExplore.exe and then in turn use iExplore.exe to send out traffic over the internet. So this traffic um, might appear to be coming from a legitimate source. It might appear to be legitimate HTTP traffic from iExplore.exe, but in fact, you know, it's just, it's actually malicious traffic that's been masked. It's just been kind of hidden uh, by using iExplore.exe as the kind of overall process through which the traffic is being sent. Okay, so that improves stealthiness. So kind of having discussed now why a bot master might prefer to use an HTTP bot, in other words, things like stealthiness at the network level, stealthiness at the, uh, at the client level, and also uh, the ability to really circumvent firewalls and other common security mechanisms, I'd like to now dive into how an actual HTTP bot works and look at some of the mechanics. And I'm going to actually do that in the next video. So hope you join me for that. Thanks a lot.